so that we can go live, which I have now initiated. Uh, so let's uh, launch the event, uh, Excellencies, dear colleagues. Um, let me also here we are muting who is not muted. Um, Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning to who is with us on Webex. So is now watching the recording of this uh, event. We would like to start by thanking the Forum on Trade, Environment and the Sustainable Development Goals, also known as TESS, to have joined forces with the Geneva Environment Network to offer today a new session organized within the framework of the Geneva Big Plastic Pollution Dialogues that aims to provide governments and stakeholders with a holistic overview of options and pathways for mobilizing resources for an effective treaty implementation, systems change, and the just transitions required to end plastic pollution. The Geneva Big Plastic Pollution Dialogues have kept the international community in Geneva and beyond engaged on this topic since the end of uh, 2020, making links with various international processes uh, and are organized by the Geneva Environment Network in collaboration with the Basel Rotterdam and Stockholm Convention Secretariat, the Center for International Environmental Law, the Global Governance Center at the Graduate Institute, IUCN, Norway, Switzerland, the Forum on Trade, Environment and the SDGs, and the University of Geneva. As most of you know, the third series of dialogues kicked off after the adoption last year for historical resolution at the United Nations Environment Assembly, setting up the path to a global treaty to end plastic pollution. The resolution requested the convening of an intergovernmental negotiating committee, known as IN, INC, INC, to develop an international legally binding instrument on plastic pollution, including the marine environment, of which the fourth session will take place in April in Ottawa, Canada. So taking place during this inter intersessional period ahead of INC4, this session aims at supporting governments and stakeholders to advance negotiations and secure an ambitious outcome. And before you are formally welcomed by our chair and moderator, Caroline Dierbeerbeck, executive director of the Forum on Trade and uh, Environment and, and the SDGs, let me remind you that the documents presented, the summary, as well as the video of the event will be made available on the webpage of this event. The link is being uh, shared uh, in the chat and also available on the screen. And throughout the event, those of you, so you can all raise your questions by using the Q&A box. We have a dedicated session to answer this after the, the, the presentations or, or to element the, the discussion. And it's also important, you will see in the chat that a lot of links will be shared to link to what the various uh, um, colleagues who have joined the panel today uh, um, uh, are being uh, presenting. So with that, with no further ado, Caroline, the floor is yours. Don't forget to unmute yourself. You are still muted, Caroline, because I muted you a few minutes ago, so ah, sorry for that. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Diana, and thank you so much for the very warm welcome. It's always a great pleasure to collaborate with the Geneva Environment Network. And thank you to everyone who's joined us today um, for this discussion on resource mobilization and financing uh, related to the implementation of the Plastics Treaty that's under negotiation. Now, the premise for um, this webinar today is that Ending plastic pollution will require system change across the life cycle of plastics and will also require just and fair transitions. So we need a treaty um, that can catalyze the necessary system change, support those just transitions, and also ensure adequate means of implementation. So we will need a treaty that has very specific provisions targeting to spur and support the kind of resource mobilization um, that is needed. Many governments have um, expressed views on this topic, but what's clear is that there's a strong recognition of the need to mobilize resources from a range of different sources in all countries, and especially for developing countries, given the range of needs that they will have. And in terms of means of implementation, we're conscious um, that these are, relate to financing, but also to technology and to capacity building as well. Our focus today will be largely on the financing piece of the puzzle. So what we've learned um, over the past year is that implementing the treaty will require large scale mobilization of public and private resources and financing. So what we want to do with this webinar today is to help inform um, governments and stakeholders on the road to INC4 and beyond on what is the sort of scope 
of resource mobilization and financing needs, the range of potential sources, and the options for financial mechanisms and related decision making. Here we're quite clear, the speakers today I think will show that there will be a need for a holistic approach to mobilise resources, to leverage those that are already there, and to align financing that is available with the goals of the treaty. So we've got a really great uh, group of speakers today who will go through some of these needs, the options and pathways forward. So we've organised the session into three kind of elements. We've got a, a, quite a lineup of speakers, but they're all great and they will all um, be very um, short and sweet. So hopefully keep you all motivated who are listening um, because it's a, it's a lot of presentations to get through. But we really wanted to provide this holistic view. So the first we'll look at um, some of the, the needs from uh, for the, the financing needs associated with the treaty. Then we'll look at some of the um, experiences with existing MEAs and the diversity of approaches and options that have already been um, that are already sort of out there that we can learn from. We'll look specifically at some of the options for the financial uh, mechanism or mechanisms um, in the treaty itself. And then we'll look at some of the innovative um, sources of resourcing. So related to implementing the polluter pay pays principle, the role of private finance, partnerships and resources, and also how we can align public finance and resources with the treaty goals as well. So without further ado, I'd like to move to our first speaker. Each of them will speak just for five to seven um, minutes each. The very first speaker is Mahesh Sugatan, who's a colleague of mine at TESS, our Senior Policy Advisor on Plastics. And he's just going to quickly highlight the scope of needs related to resource mobilization and financing and to sort of set the scene just to um, give us some context for the discussion that follows on the sources and options and mechanisms. So Mahesh, you have the floor. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, thank you and <clears throat> thank you for setting the scene for today's event. As Carolyn has stated, significant finance and resources will be needed to be mobilized for effective implementation of a treaty that spurs systems change and just transitions needed to end plastic pollution. So my presentation today is going will aim to highlight the diversity of resources ne needs that are likely to arise with a particular focus on highlighting the range of financing needs that developing countries have highlighted and drawing in particular from a sample of submission so far to the INC process. But first, stepping back, it is useful to consider some of the big picture analysis of the cost implications of ambitious action to address plastic pollution. Here we can draw on two recent reports that have tried to shed light in different ways on this. So in the first slide, uh, what you'll see is the Nordic Council of Ministers report towards ending plastic pollution by 2040 estimates in a scenario where global rules are adopted to implement 15 far-reaching policy interventions across the plastics life cycle, cumulative public expenditure from 2025 to 2040 would total about US $1.5 trillion, while a further $15.4 trillion would be needed from the private sector. In their analysis, governments would cover the cost of expanding collection, sorting, and disposal infrastructure, while the private sector would cover investment in the production of virgin plastics and alternative materials, recycling infrastructure, and the expansion of new business models. Notably, this is less than the funding required by their business as usual scenario, which would require a high level of, high level of investment in continued plastic production and waste management to address increased plastic pollution. Next slide, please. Notably, both the Nordic Council scenario figure as well as the OECD projections under their own global ambition scenario, uh, which is presented in the slide, the cost and consequently resource implications will vary between developed and developing countries. OECD modeling shows that non-OECD countries will have greater needs across all the activities that they've identified for reducing plastic pollution. Overall, the costs are sub substantially higher in non-OECD countries amounting to 0.62% GDP loss from baseline in 2040 than in the OECD countries, where costs amount to 0.37% loss from baseline GDP. The largest costs as a share of GDP of global ambitious action are projected for fast-growing countries with less advanced management systems, such as Sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> 
So investment needs, for example, for waste collection, sorting, and treatment amount to more than $1 trillion U.S. trillion between 2020 and 2040 for non-OECD countries combined. That said, implementation of an ambitious treaty will require an investment of resources domestically by both developing as well as developed countries. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the diversity of financing needs that are going to be required. Looking now at the treaty on resource mobilization needs, we know that there are a range of kinds of means of implementation that will be required. So this is going to include financing, technology, capacity, and capacity building. In my presentation here, I'm going to focus just on the financing part of it. Now, the figure in this slide aims to illustrate that there are a diversity of financing needs. Firstly, there are financial needs associated with the cost of the core activities of secretariat and running the conference and parties. Second, there are administrative and institutional costs at the domestic level related to treaty implementation. This could include costs related to meeting, monitoring, and reporting obligations under the, under the treaty, as well as incremental costs that governments face associated with implementing specific treaty-related provisions, such as new regulations to meet product design requirements, or related to commitments to eliminate or restrict problem, problematic plastics, implementation of waste management provisions, and cleaning up of legacy waste. Third, and linked to that capacity to implement are a range of costs for enabling and supporting the systemic changes with countries. Here, for instance, we know that around the world, the ability of many businesses to advance changes in production, business models, or products will rely, will rely on regulatory incentives, but on also on access to finance, technologies, and capacity building. In some instances, there, there are likely to be costs associated with transitioning away from certain products and production methods, which will also require attention to financing to ensure just transition. In addition, there may be a range of activities beyond what are directly in the treaty that may be relevant, such as, for instance, supporting clean water infrastructure in countries in ways that would reduce the need for plastic bottles. Adequate financing will potentially if enable effective national action to address pollution all along the plastics value chain. As various country submissions to the INC from both developing and developing countries make clear, public finance and ODA alone will, will be vital, but not be sufficient to address the scale of plastics pollution challenge and the range of needs across the life cycle. The treaty provisions themselves can play a role by providing, a regula by providing regulatory certainty and environment to guide and catalyze private sector investment. There will still be a need for focused efforts to mobilize a range of sources of finance. And others in, my, in the panel that are going to speak after me will go into more detail and will review the range of these sources. Next slide, please. Now, what have developing countries highlighted as priority needs? This slide provides a brief sample of some of the views. So finally, while my opening slides highlight that in both developing and developed countries, there will be significant needs of financing, we know that developing countries face higher fiscal constraints and more limited access to private sector financing and technology on fair terms. So I want to close here by highlighting a sample of needs that developing countries have highlighted in their submissions to the INC process. Critically, what the slide reveals is that there are both a range of common needs that highlight and also highlight resource mobilization needs across the life cycle. Now, the table and the discussions at the INC have provided examples of some of these financing needs at every stage of the life cycle. Uh, so these includes things like legacy plastics and remediation, uh, improving waste management capacity, support for meeting product design requirements, support for switch to non-plastic substitutes, and support associated with the phase out of particular chemicals and products. So the challenge going forward is for us to develop a clear understanding of what kinds of financing and resources are needed for addressing each of these needs, where we can source that financing or technology most suitable for addressing those needs, how we can ensure that resources flow towards the key priority areas, including the larger systemic needs, and what kind of international mechanisms, partnerships, and initiatives can be catalyzed by the treaty. In closing, I'd also like to highlight the fact that we mustn't forget legacy plastic pollution that exists. And there also needs to be efforts made to raise resources to clean up existing legacy plastic pollution as well globally.
I'm really looking forward to hear from my other speakers who will take up some of these issues uh, mentioned here. And thank you again, Carolyn, uh, and over to you. You're muted, Caroline. My apologies, a mental blank on the glories of WebEx. Um, thank you very much, Mahesh, a great introduction. So I'm gonna turn directly now to Elena Chima, who's gonna look, um, provide an overview of, of what we have done in other MEAs around issues of financing and the range of ways in which um, governments have sought to address financing needs. So Elena, over to you, please. Uh, thank you very much, Caroline, for, for for the invitation, for the introduction. So I'm going to try an impossible task right now, which is to try and set the scene for our conversation today and try to provide an overview uh, as comprehensive as possible of what already exists uh, in terms of resource mobilization and financing. And when I say what already exists, I mean uh, what approaches, what mechanisms we can find in existing MEAs. And that is already a first key message of my presentation, which is that already a lot exists. Uh, we have a whole universe of MEAs, of treaty regimes, uh, that deal with resource mobilization and financing in many different ways. So there is a lot to learn from existing mechanisms, approaches, and, and best practices. Next slide, please. And when we talk about resource mobilization, of course, we are looking at a specific component of an MEA, which is uh, the component that deals with implementation, in particular with uh, facilitating the implementation of the treaty, facilitating compliance with the treaty um, from developing countries, but not only, facilitating achieving the objectives of the treaty. When we talk about these means of implementation, we refer to finance, technology transfer, and capacity building. Uh, now, I will be focusing, and I believe that um, the speakers today will also be focusing mostly on finance, so on this part of the story, but uh, this slide is just not to forget that when we talk about resource mobilization, we are actually looking at a broader picture. Uh, so all these three elements are key uh, and they're actually very much interconnected. I will I will show you in just a few minutes that there are different MEAs where um, financial mechanisms serves the specific purpose of um, providing financial support for technology transfer, capacity building, technical assistance, training, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of, um, you know, they're, they're very much interconnected. Next slide, please. Now, this slide is, I'm not going to touch upon all these different elements. The idea uh, is just to give you a sense of the complexity of, of, of the systems, of the approaches. Uh, so these are, um, you know, different types of provision or provisions that we can find in MEAs when we talk about resource mobilization. Um, again, we say a sample. So these are possible pieces of the puzzle. Um, and the puzzle can be as big as we want. So you can have some MEAs that have a very small uh, framework with maybe just, you know, uh, two of this of these boxes, uh, but you have some treaty regimes and some MEAs that actually have a, a very big puzzle with all these pieces. So using all these pieces, I'm thinking, uh, for instance, of the climate change regime uh, that, you know, has provisions on, on almost all these different boxes that you see. Um, and this is kind of a, a second key message. Um, so the first key message is that a lot exists already and we have a lot to learn. And, and the second key message is that um, we can really see a lot of variety in terms of how uh, these different MEAs decide to deal with resource mobilization. Um, and it's really up to, the, up to the parties for each MEA, depending on the needs, to decide what of these types of provisions are needed. Maybe just the creation of a fund and something on technology transfer, or maybe looking at economic instruments and market mechanisms. So these are all possible elements that can be used. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to zoom in now on uh, financing mechanisms, and I'm going to look in particular at three different elements. Uh, so try to kind of differentiate uh, financing mechanisms to give you a broad picture based on the purpose, based on the source, and based on the structure. Um, now, again, uh, I have some examples here. I won't mention all of them, but just to give you a sense um, as to the purpose of, of these financing mechanisms, uh, some are simply just aimed at covering the administrative costs of secretariat, the COP, commissions, bodies of, of the MEA, like for the CITES Trust Fund. Um, others instead, and this is kind of the vast majority, 
of financing mechanisms that we find, uh, their goal, their objective is to facilitate uh, developing countries' efforts to comply, to implement the MEA. We can also have them combined. So for example, CITES have, has both uh, a fund uh, that deals with administrative costs, but also an external trust fund that deals with facilitating developing countries' compliance with MEAs. And then in that second box, you see that even within this broader category, we have a kind of fine, a more fine-grained uh, distinction of different ways uh, in which this purpose can be, can be achieved. And then we have some uh, financing mechanisms instead that deal with emergency assistance and compensation in case of loss or damages. Next slide, please. Uh, the second way to, to classify or distinguish these different mechanisms is to look at the source of the funding. Uh, and again, I'm not going to touch upon all these, you will have the slides, but of course we have um, some MEAs that focus on public um, finance. Um, and here we can have you know, differences between those that rely on voluntary contributions and mandatory contributions. We can also have combinations, uh, like the multilateral fund of the Montreal Protocol, for example, with mandatory contributions for uh, developed countries and then voluntary contributions uh, for, for everyone else. Um, and even within uh, the developed countries, uh, the share of contribution is different for each. So here we can also see a very nice application of the CBDR principle, of the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. Uh, we have sometimes a combination of these sources. So uh, the Green Climate Fund is a very good example because it combines uh, contributions from member states and public, private, so mixed uh, finances um, through the um, uh, through the private sector facility of the Greek Climate Fund, which has been um, which has been financing projects and activities co-financed private and uh, and public uh, sources. Uh, another interesting combination is the adaptation fund of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, here we have some voluntary contributions from member states, but we also have a levy a levy of 2% of, of the certified emission reductions issued uh, for each CDM project uh, activity that is, that is performed. So not only there are these different sources, but again, each MEA can also you know, create mechanisms that mix uh, these different sources. So we, you know, there is not a one-size-fits-all approach or, or, or a silver bullet. Next slide, please. The final way in which I like to classify these financing mechanisms is the structure. Uh, and again, uh, we have some MEAs that create, establish their own standalone mechanisms, some that rely on what is already there, such as the GEF, and then we have some hybrid mechanisms. Um, I'm going to just uh, finish in just a few seconds. I just want to end with a, with the final key message. So the first one was that uh, a, a lot is already there. So we have many examples of different mechanisms, and I tried to give you an overview. The second is that of all the provisions that we can have dealing with resource mobilization, um, you know, more or less can be used by each MEA depending on the needs. And the final key message is that, again, um, each MEA often follows more than one approach uh, when it comes to the purpose, when it comes to the source, when it comes to the structure. I'm going to leave you with one example that I think sums uh, this up very well. Uh, which is the, the climate change regime. Um, so here we have uh, several MEAs, um, and here we have, again, many approaches that are adopted. Uh, so first of all, all those provisions that I showed you in the second slide are more or less present. When it comes to financing mechanisms, you have different funds for different purposes. So you have the loss and damage fund that deals with loss and damage, uh, as the name suggests. You have the green climate fund that finances mitigation and, and adaptation projects, so different purposes. Uh, you have some funds, as I showed you earlier, that rely on public, on public and public-private, on public plus levies. So there are combinations of, of all those mechanisms. And then you have some, and you can see them listed here, that rely on existing facilities like the GEF uh, for the adaptation fund, and then specific funds that have been uh, created. Uh, so once again, um, one size fits all doesn't really work. So all these different elements that we can find in the different treaties, they can be harnessed in different ways and combined depending on our needs. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much, Elena. And I forgot to introduce you properly at the beginning as a lecturer in international environmental law at the University of Geneva. And thank you so much for providing that overview of your expertise across the range of regimes and, and how what sort of considerations are relevant for those involved in the plastics treaty context. So thank you very much.
So now we're going to turn to someone who is um, very much involved in the Plastics Treaty um, negotiations is Tim Grebiel, who's a senior lawyer and policy advisor at the Environmental Investigation Agency, has done a lot of work on this issue of financial mechanisms, and particularly around the treaty, the Plastics Treaty. So it'd be great to hear your reflections, please, Tim. Thank you, and I assume everybody can hear me. Um, I do not have slides, so I will have to captivate you with my voice. Let me begin by making two overarching observations. Um, first, I think we should have no illusions that in order to end plastic pollution, or at least to approximate that objective, that this treaty will require a robust financial framework. Secondly, I'll also state that, uh, as the previous, uh, previous speaker alluded to, it's, it's not really an either or issue, such as it's, is often depicted in the discussions on whether we should have a newly established multilateral fund versus relying on the Global Environment Facility or Jeff, but rather we're gonna need an all of the above approach, just given the nature of, of, of the problem and its magnitude. So in terms of the plastic treaty, I think it's important to talk about the types of activities and costs that require financial support or that will require financial support, because to my mind, this answers the question on the mechanisms best positioned to deliver that financial support. So I'd like to start with identifying what we're gonna need the money for. Um, first, as was, as was previously mentioned and has been identified, we are going to need to finance enabling activities in developing countries. These are the activities that enable implementation and compliance. They, um, they go towards a uh, government by and large, and they include things such as institutional strengthening. Uh, so, for example, focal points having a, a focal points in government that are overseeing the international and national implementation. It covers things such as reporting and monitoring and policy development and implementation. Enabling activities should be provided universally to all the eligible countries to ensure that we get some sort of baseline of supports that governments can rely upon to fulfill these core obligations that in the end is what's gonna make the treaty work. You know, we're gonna to have to have people who are overseeing uh, compliance. We're gonna to have to have reporting and monitoring to, to measure our progress. And we're gonna to have to have policy and development and implementation. So that's the first category. This, the second category uh, that we will need to finance are certain uh, so-called clearinghouse functions. So some examples of these include the you know, capacity building and training um, of the focal points uh, of uh, industrial actors, the education and awareness raising, the information exchange, um, that's often involved, uh, uh, regional cooperation, coordination. These are things that are identified in the treaty um, and the, the, the regular delivery of these, of these clearinghouse functions should be a priority. I'll give an example of the Montreal Protocol because I think it provides a good model uh, that should be replicated here. But there in the Montreal Protocol delivers these clearinghouse functions via its Compliance Assistance Program or CAP, which oversees a series of regional networks um, some, some eight, if I recall correctly, that meet annually and which have been, uh, you know, where the focal points will meet annually um, and there will be the information exchange, there will be capacity building and training sessions, there will be education and awareness raising, uh, new ozone officers come meet old uh, ozone officers and there's an there's a, there's a exchange of the experience that has been garnered. Um, and they meet annually and they have proven to be very successful in supporting implementation. Uh, these regional networks are overseen by UNEP um, and is part of the compliance assistance program. And it really is one of the main factors that contributes to the Montreal Protocol being considered the most successful environmental agreement in the world. So that's the second category, uh, the clearinghouse functions. And then the third, um, we will need to finance agreed incremental costs, as was mentioned previously. These are, in short, these refer to the additional expenses related to compliance and you know, with the new commitments. It's hard to predict these at this stage as we're still drafting the treaty and we're not quite sure what the commitments are, but there would be a list of agreed incremental costs, presumably that would accompany these new commitments. So let me just pause here and say that these first three categories, enabling activities, clearinghouse functions, and agreed incremental costs are best delivered, and to me can only properly be delivered via a newly established multilateral fund. Now, uh, this is why so many de developing countries, in my opinion, are demanding one. I will also note that Jeff was never necessarily designed to deliver this type of financing with the regularity, consistency, and predictability that is required here. Now, there's a, those are for the first three categories. Now, there is a fourth category, sort of a, a broad one, and this will be the need 
for the treaty or for us to find ways to provide concessional finance for specific projects across the value chain. I am thinking in particular here for projects related to waste management or infrastructure or remediation, but there are others as well. And you can sort of identify what will be needed um, for project specific investments along the value chain. And, you know, this concessional finance will sometimes be provided to governments and sometimes to the private sector to unlock their investment. On this, uh, I think Jeff is very well positioned to deliver project based concessional financing to governments. That is sort of its main raison d'etre as it were, and we should carve out a role and, and create a window to Jeff to access these funds. So it's a very important aspect. Likewise, we should carve out a role at, for and create a window to multilateral development banks, regional development banks, and international financial institutions, so such as the World Bank or the Asia Development Bank, in particular to help enlist them to help us unlock private sector finance. So these could be through preferential loans or blended finance opportunities. We'd really like to have the MDBs and the IFIs help create help, help, uh, create windows and opportunities for us to get some of this private sector uh, investment by providing some favorable terms through concessional finance. And we're going to have to be innovative in the way that we do this because I don't think it's been done in any really systematic way um, that, that, I, that I think is required here. Um, and especially at the scale that's going to be required for, for plastic pollution. So I'll stop here. Uh, we have, you know, those sort of different types of activities and costs and, and, and the way I think they're best delivered. But I think, you know, taken together, the, the picture that I'm trying to paint is pretty clear. We need an all hands on deck approach towards providing financial support. And it needs to start with the newly established dedicated multilateral fund with well-designed windows to Jeff, to the multilateral divide, uh, development banks and to the international financial institutions. So I've started to, re to, to refer to this as a plastics MLF plus, and I'm hopeful that we'll see some, some movement in this direction at INC4. Thank you. I'm muted, Caroline. Sorry. Um, thank you very much, uh, Tim, for that very comprehensive view. I like the all hands on deck um, analogy and also um, for helping people to get a picture that, um, you know, I think you're, it's multilateral fund plus or multilateral fund in context, right? That there are other mechanisms around it or that it can lead to. Um, so, and also I think you've underlined this idea that there may be different mechanisms that are suited for delivering different, uh, on different needs or, you know, delivering different kinds of, um, for different purposes. So that's a little bit the scene, um, a starting point. We can come back in the questions if anyone has those. Um, for Tim and for others. But now what we wanted to do is to look at some of the other ways in which the treaty may be able to um, mobilize and leverage uh, resources. So the first of this is around the implementation of the polluter pays principle. Um, and so this is you know, how we've uh, framed it for the purposes of this meeting. And here we have three speakers. The first will be Ambrogio uh, Miserocchi from uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation. He's going to walk us through a little bit the role of EPR schemes and how they can um, be part of this resource mobilization story. We'll follow that with a perspective um, from Sumerjit Gar, from Jeet Kar, sorry, from the World Economic Forum, who's going to look a little bit more at some of the developing country experiences with that. And then we'll turn to Dominic Charles uh, from the Mindaru Foundation, who is going to look, um, help us think through and understand better the proposals around plastic um uh, pl plastic uh, sorry fees on primary plastics in the treaty so we're going to start first with Ambrogio, please thank you very much caroline and i hope you can hear me okay um so first of all thank you very much for organizing this exchange it's very valuable to have this ahead of uh, the inc4 and for having me as a speaker uh, to talk about epr and as you said, I wanted to focus on an, another mechanism uh, that might be able to, will be able uh, to, to, to support the treaty implementation. And I really would like to focus on one specific piece of the puzzle to complete the picture on uh, financing the, the system change that we need. So for this reason, I really wanted to focus on the case for EPR. And if we go to the next slide, I want to talk as fee-based EPR as one specific, very specific policy instrument to implement 
the polluter pays principle because it's not the only mechanism that uh, we, we know. And in this presentation today, so I will focus on EPR as fee-based uh, extended producer responsibility schemes, which is basically a performance-based regulation where the outcomes and the objectives are set and defined by law. And so are the roles and responsibilities of all the stakeholders that are involved in delivering the, the outcomes and the objectives. And specifically to the fee-based uh, model, EPR requires companies who introduce uh, products or packaging is the most known sector into a country's market to be responsible for and participate in the management of, uh, as well as providing funding that are dedicated to the after use um, collection and processing and management of those certain products. And uh, just to contextualize, often we hear about deposit refund systems or DRS that can work alongside or integrated into fee based mandatory PR policies. And as a last uh, technical notion, in these examples of uh, polluter-based principle, um, the revenues generated by these schemes uh, are based on the underlying principle of the net cost. And this is very important to keep in mind. If we move to the next slide, um, one information, one piece of information to why it is important to talk about EPR is because EPR is actually a proven mechanism nowadays to both reduce waste disposal and at the same time increase a uh, collection for recycling rate and in some cases also recycling um, in practice. And what you see in the chart is an analysis that we performed a couple of years ago, trying to compare countries with no EPR, countries with limited or voluntary, and countries with mandatory EPR schemes. And we see that on the right side of the chart, uh, countries with mandatory EPR schemes uh, perform in average much better than the other countries um, and this chart refers to the collection for recycling rate. And the concept of EPR is uh, applied um, across different sectors. In the chart, I'm focusing on plastic packaging, um, which is quite relevant in the context of the treaty. But of course, we have extensive experience with extensive literature uh, on other sectors, including electronic waste, batteries, vehicles, tires, and others. And at the same time, I want to highlight that in the past years, there has been growing evidence that EPR can have a much a really positive impact on other sectors, including textiles, other plastic products, and also construction materials, among others. So the first thing is that EPR is a proven mechanism to reduce waste disposal and increase recycling. The second key message that I want to share with you today on the next slide is that EPR actually um, I need the next slide, please. Thank you very much. Because beyond increasing uh, and, and, and performing well on, on the waste management part of the equation, EPR has also proven to be able to generate funding as, as a mechanism and alleviate both pressure on the public budget as well as pressure on taxpayers. So I just wanted to bring in some data to quantify the input, the, 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 the impact that EP, EPR can have. And on the left side, we see that an estimate back in 2015 uh, performed in Europe uh, quantified the impact of fee-based EPR to around 3 billion euros a year. But then we also performed a more recent assessment uh, based on the 2022 data and including DRS schemes and taxation in some EU member states, we estimated that revenues could be up to 7 billion euros or $7.5 billion a year in Europe alone. And uh, quoting one or citing one specific example from France, um, uh, their uh, annual report uh, based on 2021 data shows that their revenue was around $900 million per year. And then the other example that I wanted to share is in the context of South Africa, where um, um, the estimate of the revenues from EPR schemes were, was 2.5 billion runs or $130 million over five years. So the second message here is that this is the amount of money that can be generated through EPR schemes as a domestic uh, resource mobilization um, tool uh, that can contribute, uh, of course, on top of the ODA and the international financing that we heard about uh, with the previous speakers. And then on the last slide, I want to go back to a slide that was presented at the beginning of this session. But I really would like to spend a little bit more time focusing on the $1.5 trillion uh, 
that Mahesh mentioned at the beginning of, of the session today. Because we see that we have $1.5 trillion that will have to be provided over the period 2025-2040. And if we zoom in, this 1.5 trillion uh, basically represents the non-private direct investment. So the 15.4 in the global rule scenario are direct investment from the private sector, while the 1.5 represent the, the money that is required um, beyond those investment, direct investment of the private sector. And what I wanted to say here is that with the numbers that I presented before, EPR can really have a, a critical role to play, a significant role to play in providing this funding and remove pressure on the public budget at the national domestic level. Um, and um, one more point uh, that I think uh, plays in favor of EPR as a policy tool is that by enforcing and establishing EPR legislation, you would provide clarity to the market and providing uh, clarity to the market, you will be able to attract public and private investments to cover the capex, so the capital cost, where infrastructure is lacking nowadays. So there, there is this uh, twofold uh, beneficial uh, impact of EPR legislation. One is that it's actually able to provide a significant amount of funding for running um, the implementation of, uh, of the treaty obligations and cover this part of the public budget that is required uh, and is outlined in this, in this slide, but also at the same time, create that uh, trust, create that confidence in the market by, by creating harmonization and clarity on where investment is actually needed. So I hope this provides a little bit of clarity on one specific tool that can really complement the international financing that we talked about and really bring it to the domestic level where, where resources will be needed uh, nevertheless. So, Caroline, I stop here and I hand over back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambro, for that overview of where EPR schemes uh, may play a role in the resource mobilization. I'm going to turn directly now to Jeet Kaur from the World Economic Forum to review some of the lessons and experiences that he has from their work uh, with developing countries on this topic. Jeet, over to you. Thanks for that, um, Caroline. Um, thanks to Tess and UNEP for this very timely information session and to the other speakers as well for sharing uh, very useful insights. Uh, could we go to the next slide, um, right, the one after this? Thanks. Um, so you can see here um, some of the countries that are in the process of or already have something tantamount to a mandatory EPR for packaging. In the discussions um, leading up to the potential implementation of the plastic treaty, EPR as a concept has been gaining a lot of ground, including in developing countries, and rightly so, as the speaker before me pointed out, EPR has proven to be a really useful tool in the circular economy. But um, one also needs to inspect some of the sticky challenges that are peculiar to developing countries. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? Uh, we'll look at some of the very common challenges that are endemic to developing countries that come up in the discussions that we have had on the ground. Um, the first, and, and I think a very primordial sort of a problem is that in many of these developing countries, think about these developed countries even more, there is a large informal sector that is even outside the, the, the fold of EPR reach. And here I'm talking about basic goods and services. If goods are being sold in the informal, in the shadow economy, how can one expect EPR systems to reach um, those sales and then levy a fee? The second key point that we have encountered is a kind of a trust deficit between parties that are paying into, um, think about businesses, and parties that are implementing EPR schemes, so in many cases, the government. Um, and one precedent to this is often um, some sort of a plastic tax or a pollution tax, which many of the developing countries have thought about implementing or have already implemented. But there hasn't been a lot of transparency in how that um, fee has been earmarked. So if producers are paying into a, a pot or a tax that is supposed to work towards a circular economy, but it flows into the general government budget, then there is not much incentive among the private sector to actually be true stakeholders in an EPR scheme. The third one is quite uh, self-explanatory. Um, if you do not have an airtight definition of what a producer is, uh, you're going to have a lot of free ride that stems out of an inadequate EPR system. The fourth one, 
and a lot of speakers before me have also made uh, reference to this. Um, there are insufficient resources in many developing countries to properly enforce EPR. Uh, Mahesh made a, made a reference to fiscal constraints in a lot of developing countries. So if you are not able to allocate um, what, whatever resources are needed to set up a, um, a strong and robust monitoring and evaluation or an enforcement even uh, system for EPR, it's going to be difficult to then scale it up um, or even go at a more granular level in terms of different types of plastics, pay different rates of, uh, of EPR. The next point is on how do you treat importers? Um, and this is becoming increasingly contentious in um, e-commerce related discussions. Uh, do your imp uh, how do you make an EPR system that also makes importers or imported goods pay into the pot of EPR? And this is an area which we'll see increasing work in, um, not just in plastics, but also in textiles. The next point um, really looks at the quality and sophistication of waste management or recycling systems in developing countries. Um, one thing that might be um, good to think about, and the previous speaker also nicely alluded to that, is EPR is a really good source of uh, running or operating expenses or circular economy in any country. But it needs to be complemented with capital expenditure that will then help set up the infrastructure in waste management that can actually lead to proper performance of the EPR scheme. So if you do not have a well-functioning waste management system, then your EPR is less likely to succeed. Um, the next point is on how you define the KPIs of your EPR system. Is it really focusing on the collection of, um, of waste or collection of packaging? Or is it really um, taking you to concrete numbers on how much percentage of goods you want to, be, uh, want to have recycled in the market? If you have an undue focus on collection, then chances are that you will have very little control on what happens to that waste after it is collected. So while designing a good EPR system, one needs to really look at KPIs, not just in collection, but also on what happens to the collected waste. And the final point, um, which, have come, which has come up in many discussions, is on finding a dignified, productive, and meaningful place for a very large quantum of informal waste pickers that we see in many of the uh, developing countries. And they really form the backbone of the circular economy in many of these countries as well. So if you are designing um, a good EPR system, I think that is a very good opportunity to formalize this sector and make them meaningful stakeholders in a well-functioning EPR system. Could we have the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, so we have encountered a few um, bright spots, um, good examples that we can consider. In Chile, for example, there were a lot of references on how the government was able to formally include waste pickers. There's, of course, uh, work that remains to be done, but it, it's really in, in a good direction. And other countries could have a look at um, how that was done. Then the next point um, we encountered was in South Africa. And I think Ambrose's uh, presentation also showed that I think 90% of EPR funds you're marked actually went into the circular economy related expenditures in South Africa. And that is the result of a lot of stakeholder engagement with industry associations and uh, producer responsibility organizations that were already existing. Uh, the good news is that other countries uh, like Indonesia and Vietnam are trying to do something similar. And finally, we have um, some examples of segregation of types of plastic waste in India. So dividing um, the KPIs of how much you need to collect and recycle based on the type of plastic. So that shows some level of maturity and your chances of success are higher as a system then. Um, so to sum up, uh, while um, EPR probably is not the silver bullet for circular economy or implementation of the global plastic treaty in, uh, uh, in the, the global south, it does prove to be a really useful mechanism and needs to be looked at um, with a lot of complementary approaches that have been proposed. And there are other speakers that are going to um, go into further detail. But just to give a summary, um, some sort of a global fund uh, that relies on um, plastic producers. And this could really look at uh, setting up some of the critical infrastructure, some sort of a multilateral funding mechanism to help developing countries. And you can also add um, ODA into this mix. Then looking at some of the um, import-export problems. So how do you make sure that exporting country responsibility organizations pay their fair share to countries that are actually dealing with the waste or importing countries. And finally, plastic credits or plastic taxes. And in many countries, we have seen some sort of an evolution from plastic tax to EPR. 
um, but it's important to actually take learnings from plastic tax levies um, seriously for that. Thanks. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Jeet, for um, helping us think through some of the priorities and considerations uh, from a developing country perspective um, on EPRs and also highlighting some of the ways in which um, they have innovated in the way that they are uh, designing and implementing these schemes. You've At the end, you mentioned um, this issue of plastic taxes and fees. And with that, I'm delighted to introduce Dominic Charles, who's the Deputy Director of Plastics at the Mindaroo Foundation, to talk a little bit about the fee, uh, options around a fee on primary plastic production. Go ahead, Dominic, please. Wonderful. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you to the previous speakers. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. So just give me two ticks. Let's put that on the full screen. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so as Carolyn said, great segue from the previous speakers to talk about um, um, how a plastic pollution fee, so a fee on primary plastic production, can be a critical complement to the other sources of funding, both public and, and private that we've heard about previously. So um, just very quickly, like Mindaroo um, started immediately after INC2 um, to bring together a coalition of partners um, from um, on the analytical side and, and then advisors from academia, civil society and professional services to work on, uh, on this idea. We published a, a report ahead of INC3 that looked at the design options um, for such a, a provision, really digging into the technical and legal um, side of things. And then we intend um, about um, six weeks ahead of INC4 to publish an impact study looking at the potential impacts that a, a, a plastic pollution fee could have across environmental, social, and economic uh, needs. So what we're talking about here is a fee that can support developing countries to cover and meets the significant and unique costs of treaty implementation that can end plastic pollution. So those significant and unique costs could be, firstly, the development of safe and environmentally sound waste management infrastructure. And specifically here, we mean the capital expenditure required to meet formal collection, sorting, recycling, and disposal needs. So as we heard, like uh, EPR, for example, is a, a, a great source of funding for the operating expenses of um, dealing with plastic waste. But there is a chicken and egg issue with getting EPR schemes off the ground. A fee on primary polymers could raise the um, funds to uh, build the capex, to build the capital infrastructure, to get those systems up and running, so kind of highly complementary. Secondly, the fee could support the transition to a sustainable circular economy and, and the infrastructure required. Again, generating the capital expenditure required to scale reuse and substitution models. So at the very top of the, um, the webinar, Mahesh talked about how regulatory stimulus is going to be required um, to um, accelerate a transition to these circular alternatives. Um, so st stimuli around design for recycling or the elimination of single-use plastics. But regulation alone um, is, is unlikely to um, be, be enough. We're going to actually need a, probably a significant investment from the public sector to get these um, fundamental shifts in the plastics economy up and running. So um, here, the, a fee could provide that, that capital investment. Thirdly, the fee could support a, a just transition. So for example, we know that today, um, waste workers across the globe are, um, are, are not um, through collecting and selling plastic waste, achieving a living wage. Um, we expect that they're, you know, about 50% below what they require on a revenue per tonne um, basis, um, a, a living wage and, a, and a, a, a plastic pollution fee could um, support that just transition. And lastly, in, the, in addressing legacy plastic waste. So th there are only high level estimates today of both the uh, amount and cost of remediating uh, legacy waste in unsanitary landfills, on beaches, in the ocean. Um, the, the costs of doing that um, are inevitably going to be extremely high um, and will require an additional source of funding beyond what um, the, the public or private sector uh, might be able to invest. And across 
these four um, potential uses, um, we expect that we are looking at uh, a total sum of in the region of 30 to $40 billion per year in developing countries. Um, and that is after um, additional, um, additional uh, financing from, for example, from EPR. And that is just a, a magnitude of uh, investment that is not going to be met realistically by traditional donor um, overseas development aid. Very quickly, I'm going to skim through like what the, the design of such a fee might look like, um, both in terms of how it would be imposed and then how revenues might be distributed. Um, design options consider the legal force and whether it's a uniform or differentiated fee. We would um, recommend it's a, a mandatory fee that's uniform across all countries to ensure a level playing field for industry, prevent free riders. The entity subject to the fee would be polymer producers in the country where they're operating. There would be exemptions for producers of sustainable recycled polymers and other alternative polymers that are deemed sustainable. And then the size of the fee would be set in order to cover the costs of an ambitious treaty. So for example, we've, looked, we've seen numbers earlier of the costs of implementing the Nordic Council's global rule scenario. Um, and the, the costs I referred to there, the 30, $40 billion a year is assuming that kind of ambitious treaty um, is what needs to be implemented. On the distribution of revenues, a share of the fee could be retained by the producer country to cover administration costs. The use of the revenues would be you know, those kind of four potential buckets that I described on the previous slide. In terms of eligibility criteria, we would assume that all low and middle income countries according to the World Bank's criteria, that's what we're assuming in our modeling. And in terms of the form of forms of funding, we're talking about grants here especially for those um, projects such as in waste management where there is no obvious business model to support um, concessionary loans. Then in terms of like the expected environmental impacts, um, so we're um, publishing our results in March, but a sneak preview um, of where we are is that, you know, we're, we're estimating that without a fee, um, an ambitious treaty will simply fall short of ending plastic pollution. So if we look at the example of mismanaged plastic waste, um, on a business as usual scenario, we're seeing roughly a doubling of mismanaged plastic waste um, forecast for the next 15 years. The global rule scenario um, from the Nordic Council without any fee on primary plastic polymer would see a significant bending of that, that upward curve, you know, a reduction versus today, probably about 50% of mismanaged plastic waste, but still a significant, significant amount of mismanaged waste leaking into the environment. Closing that gap, fully funding um, those costs um, to deal with mismanaged plastic waste through a fee on primary plastic production would, would potentially reduce um, mismanaged waste to 10% uh, 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 of its current level. So absolutely critical to, um, in complement with um, other control measures and provisions in tackling mismanaged plastic waste. And then just finally, um, Comparing the, 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 the different examples of the polluter place principle that we've just heard about, um, just to be very clear on the distinction, EPR is where brands and producers are playing for the, paying for the products they put on the market nationally, covering the national costs of dealing with those, those products. A plastic pollution fee is a fee on virgin polymer put on the market globally, covering some of the costs of plastic pollution in developing countries, so redistributing the fees paid. So two mutually reinforcing mechanisms, providing complementary sources of finance. Thank you. Richard. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Dominic. I think it's really useful to have that overview. This is a topic that many uh, people are talking about and hearing about, and yet it's um, useful to have all of this information in one place for people to get a handle on what it is that's really being proposed and what are some of the different options. Um, hopefully that will really inform negotiators and stakeholders going forward as they consider the different uh, options for resource mobilization. So thank you very much for that. So now we're going to shift into the third um, part of this uh, discussion, which is to look at um, the role of private finance a little more closely. We've heard many of the speakers today have talked about that, highlighted its importance, 
Our colleagues at UNEP FI have been doing fantastic work to bring together um, banks, insurers, investors and others to think about their role in driving system change and supporting uh, the goal of ending plastic pollution. And so I'm delighted to ask uh, Peggy Lafort, who is the lead on pollution and circular economy at UNEP FI, together with um, one of the key players in the finance leadership group on plastics, which is hosted um, by UNEP FI, uh, to present uh, some of their ideas and work on how we can leverage and align private finance, including what that means for the treaty itself. So over to you, Peggy and Gizan. Go ahead, Peggy, please. Thank you, Caroline. Um, and I, I'm really uh, delighted to be to be with you uh, today. So good, good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening. Um, so um, with my colleague Jan Ress and, and the rest of the team at UNEPFI, we work with uh, the Finance Leadership Group on Plastics, uh, which uh, has been convened uh, uh, by UNEPFI to contribute to the development process of the future plastics instrument. And we can go to the first slide. Um, just to present you briefly, the, the Finance Leadership Group uh, on Plastics, it's a core group of banks and insurers uh, from all regions with uh, total assets close to uh, $10 trillion and which has two main objectives uh, to contribute from a private finance perspective to the development of the future uh, instrument when plastic pollution uh, and also to build awareness and readiness in the finance sector to respond to the future uh, instrument uh, through their investment and financing. Uh, we can go to next slide. Uh, so we, we've heard a lot. Uh, mobilizing financial resources will be key to the success of the future instruments. Uh, and that means uh, mobilizing public financial, financial resources, but also private financial resources. And so in this perspective, ahead of INC2, the Finance Leadership Group on Plastics formulated 10 key messages on how to accelerate and scale up uh, the mobilization of financial flows from all sources, including private. And the first key message is that the future plastics instrument has the potential to send a strong signal to member states and to finance actors on the imperative to mobilize and reorient financial uh, resources. And this can be done through the inclusion of an objective to align financial flows from all sources, public and private, with the objective and targets of the treaty. So this would be similar to what has been done in the Paris Agreement uh, in Article 21C uh, and also in the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework in its goal D. And it has proven effective. But also, uh, if we wouldn't do it in the same way in the plastics instrument, it would give an opposite signal that plastics is a lower priority than climate and, and biodiversity. Um, second key message is uh, that it's important that the future plastic instruments uh, creates a mandatory framework and environment that will enable the redirecting of financial flows. Um, so when we talk about uh, aligning financial flows and, or, and redirecting financial flows, what, what does that mean? Uh, so that's what we have explored in further details ahead of INC3, and we can go to next slide. Um, in a paper called Redirecting Financial Flows to End Plastic Pollution. Uh, because if we want to end plastic pollution, um, financial flows from all sources will not only need to be mobilized, they will also need to be massively redirected. So they will need to reduce in certain areas of the plastics value chain, like, like virgin production, and they will need to increase in uh, substitute production, in new delivery models, in collection, in recycling. And so in this paper, uh, 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 the, 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 there's um, an analysis of how the treaty can enable a systemic change for finance and how uh, the required redirections of financial flows can take shape. And so, for instance, it will be important to set clear targets along the plastics value chain uh, in such a way, finance actors know where to increase their investments and financing and where to decrease them along the, the, the value chain. Um, also, the, the, the future plastics agreement has the potential through instruments such as subsidies, plastic fee, 
the risking mechanisms to incentivize certain investments that need to increase and disincentivize others that need to decrease and, and give them longer. Uh, we'll, we'll elaborate further on this. Um, and just before handing over to Gizem, we can go to next slide. And just wanted to highlight very briefly that in the perspective of INC4, it will be very important to better understand the overall plastics finance uh, landscape and the respective role of public and private finance, which are both equally important and really understand when the, uh, really important to understand um, that the public sector has a key role to play to catalyze private finance. And uh, let me stop here and hand over to you, Gizem. Thank you very much, Peggy. I think you put it uh, in a really good context that so I can continue <laughs> uh, from a private finance institution perspective. So to, as you also said, Peggy, so to enable the systemic change, all actors, public and private, uh, including uh, financial institutions need to play their role and these roles are complementary to each other. So here I would like to make this connection from the perspective of a private finance institution and uh, give a little bit of information from our side, how we see that, how we can enable our role uh, to enable this change. So as we saw from the presentations from Mahesh and uh, Ambrogio, uh, private finance needs to um, to achieve this goal and to, to end the plastic pollution represents the lion's share. So without mobilizing the private finance, we actually cannot achieve the goal uh, to end the plastic pollution. So as private finance institutions, uh, we also need to channel the private uh, capital into the direction of solutions, take it from the problematic investments. And in the current landscape, uh, unfortunately, most of those investments in this direction are too risky uh, for the private institutions uh, with very little or sometimes no return in the absence of the right regulatory framework. In particular, the solutions on the downstream are seen as expenses rather than value creating high return investments. Of course, there are certain projects and special credit lines or special projects which are supporting these investments, but I'm talking more on the uh, general finance landscape, so the mainstream landscape. Um, there's also the challenge of getting the data to assess our risks uh, as financial institutions and look for opportunities to invest because there's no uh, disclosure requirements at the moment. And this is very costly to manually collect the data from the customers themselves. So we experienced this during the implementation of our plastic strategy in the ProCredit Group. So just to give us a, a short context, uh, ProCredit Group uh, is a group of impact-oriented SME banks operating mainly in uh, Eastern and Southeastern Europe. And in 2019, we have developed our plastic strategy to increase the sustainability of our uh, clients engaged in plastic production. We spend huge amount of time reaching to the uh, clients and explaining our strategy, why we're doing that and uh, collect the data from them in order to analyze our portfolio and eventually convince them to, to invest in the direction of that they can increase their sustainability in their production. Um, many of them did not really see a return on it apart from being more environmental friendly. And uh, many of them we managed to convince as well so that we can continue our relationship with them. But on the way, we also lost uh, clients because they didn't follow our, um, our uh, ambitious plan in reducing the, the pollution. So we see from that experience when the financial institutions try to steer the positive change without the support of other mechanisms, some of which the previous speakers mentioned very, very uh, nicely and the, 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 th the things that also financial sector can take up on, um, then we need to take the risk and the burden ourselves as the finance institutions. Perhaps as ProCredit, we have taken some, some of this risk and moved forward with our strategy, but that cannot be a realistic expectation from all financial institutions. So we can leverage the private capital by um, enhancing the risk-adjusted returns on investments with the right regulatory framework, uh, by de-risking inve the investments and increasing the return from them. Uh, and the data gap can be closed by the mandatory and harmonized disclosure requirements for companies. It would then increase the transparency, put all the financial institutions on a level playing field and not penalizing those uh, who are proactive in mobilizing their uh, financial flows towards solutions. Only then we can uh, make this change the new mainstream and uh, the course or change the course of the financial flows towards ending the plastic pollution. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, uh, Peggy and Dizam, for that overview. I think one of the things that you've been the first to emphasize here is it's not just mobilizing resources, but really to redirect um, and also to align those that are there. So the, 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 the numbers are big, but there's also a lot of money out there. We just need to pour it in the right direction. Um, so I think that's an important um, insight. And also that whilst we focus at the beginning very much on needs and costs, what we also need to do is turn it into investment opportunities so that there, there are new opportunities for the private sector and for a range of different um, types of businesses um, and countries in this in this effort. And I won't repeat the particular areas that you mentioned um, for the treaty, but I, I did think it was important that you highlighted the importance of common binding rules um, to provide the market signals um, for the for the private sector disclosure requirements as something that is useful to, to have um, in the treaty and also um, just a, a, a provisions just around the importance of aligning private finance to send signals um, to the market as well. Um, so thank you very much for that. I'm very conscious that we're likely here to run out of time at the end for much Q&A. So I do encourage those who have questions or comments to put them in the chat. I'm gonna encourage those who are panelists to reply to those. Um, it's easiest to reply if you put the questions in the Q&A. Um, but before then, I'm going to turn to our last speaker, um, who is Diana Barraclough, the Senior Economist at the UN Conference on Trade and Development. She's someone I have worked with for many years on this challenge of transforming um, the global plastics economy. And in the work at UNCTAD, they've done a lot of um, analysis on this challenge of transforming uh, uh, economic sectors to respond to environmental imperatives and to do so in ways that are fair and just. And so she's going to talk to us a little bit about the role of public finance and resources as part of this picture of resource mobilization. Over to you, Diana. Thank you. And um, thank you, Caroline, for inviting um, Ted to join this uh, very, very interesting meeting. I mean, we've really learned a lot. Um, in fact, as I started, I was also just trying to paste some of the messaging in the chat for the publications that, that we need to, to keep to our forefront. So thank you, everybody. Okay, so what you see on the screen here, I'm attempting to put in a in a kind of a broader context the plastic treaty and the concerns about plastic. And really, I think they exist within this broader and evolving concern about the need to address the challenges of global warming and climate change and development. So all of these three things we're looking at together here. So any um, any developments in the plastic treaty and in the finance for plastic, it needs to be also complementary with the SDGs and with development. And in fact, it must be complementary for them to be just and sustainable. And what I think is uh, is encouraging is that um, this is entirely possible. They can be entirely complementary. And we have, the world has done major transformations and evolutions before. We didn't used to have the problem we have of plastic waste now. It's something that has emerged over decades. Um, and we can resolve this too with a different mindset and different policies. But what we see here on the um, figure to the far left, we see how uh, production of plastic is increasing massively. We know that 79% of plastic becomes waste. And what we've seen with our Mindaru presenter earlier this afternoon is that without some of these instruments, and he was talking in particular about the EPR, I think, um, you know, the plastic waste will continue to rise. So, so we've, it's very clear to us, you know, why we're here and why we're trying to do this. I think it's worth also, though, just standing back and reflecting a bit. You know, we've just had a COP28. We've had a um, mention for the first time of uh, the need to scale down fossil fuels and talk about the start of the end of the oil era. And this will inevitably make its way through how we think about plastic because it will impact the price of plastic at the very least. So if the pledges are followed, the price of plastic will change. And so many of these things that we're thinking about will actually uh, change of their own, um, own uh, volition, I think, because price rising is a major signal. But at the same time, we want this transition to be just, and that's what this is about. And I have my next slide, please. 
So um, as requested by Carolyn, I'm focusing on the question of really trying to pull together all the different things that might not have been covered in this presentation. She put me last to try and, uh, and uh, kind of clear the, the table. So first of all, we want to think about what markets can do and they are doing in terms of plastic finance. And then we will turn to some global funds and mechanisms, but I won't talk much about that because we've heard that from other speakers. And in particular, I'm going to focus on domestic and regional levers that governments can use to guide and to redirect finance, and sometimes existing finance and sometimes finding finance in new locations. So we'll look at divesting and redirecting existing sources and then scaling up these public mechanisms that are essential. We've heard from all speakers that they are catalytic and essential. And uh, then looking at guidance from central banking. So what are the roles that the different forms of public banks in the sector can play? And finally, the role of industrial policy. So a whole lot of different hooks from which we can um, find the finance that is going to help with this uh, major ambitious challenge that lies ahead of, ahead of us. Um, on the topic of global funds, quickly, if I can just um, highlight though, UNCTAD has, uh, has for a long time talked about the need for a trade and environment fund. This was before the plastic negotiations. And as you saw, we do have a, a wide um, group of funds already available in addition to the new funds that are being discussed in the negotiations thus far. However, I think it's worth reminding ourselves that the existing funds have not been as forthcoming as, um, as we hoped. And so we really do need to look at the whole panoply, the whole menu of options for finance to do this major investment push. May I have the next slide, please? So one major source of finance, of course, is markets. And markets are extremely good at doing some things. And one of the things they've been very good at doing is inventing and producing new forms of a very useful product, which is plastic. Um, the global trade in plastic right now is over a trillion dollars per annum. We don't actually have a monetary value for the complete global production of plastic. That is something that, as our um, previous speakers, I think the pro credit and UNEP people both said, you know, we need to have proper disclosure. And uh, this will really help us get a handle on how big is really the value of the sector. But certainly what we see is that trade in plastic is enormous. And so this is, uh, markets are extremely effective at producing plastic and trading plastic. Markets have also been very effective at producing substitutes for plastic. As I mentioned, the trade in plastic is over a trillion dollars. The trade in substitutes is almost a third of that already. And this is something that has risen very rapidly. And I think this is important for, um, for all countries, but maybe particularly developing countries to think about. As we see the price of plastic rising, or if the price of plastic rises as countries follow through their pledges from COP28, if the price of plastic rises, this will impact very significantly markets for plastic. Now, the sort of the market-oriented approach would say that Schumpeterian creative destructive powers will release a great energy of um, of entrepreneurship and new innovation and new products. And this could be helped, for example, by the fee-based EPRs, which are another market mechanism, as well as the attractions of other substitutes and other markets. But as I've got here on my third point on the left, actually meeting the SDGs already, it's not a big push. It only needed 1% of global financial flows. Okay, so that's actually an incredibly small proportion of the global financial assets that were needed. And yet we found it very difficult to make that leap. So we really need to have this very strong role of public sector as well, because the green funds have been disappointing and they tend to be short term. It raises the question of what is a bankable project? Now here, at least in the world of plastic, as we see that it's a market um, mechanism and it's a market traded product and market consumed product, bankable projects should be um, may a major part of the solution. And what we need to think about is what is going to make these projects bankable. Alongside this disappointment with the $100 billion, $100 billion roadmap, this kind of global fund, we're going to need these public and private leaders to shape the market. 
So what I wanted just to show in this right hand figure here is that you know the impact on developing countries of these uh, major shifts, if we see them in plastic production, this is going to be something that they're really going to need some help adjusting to. So we see a number of countries who, for whom the exports of plastic are really a very large proportion of the exports. These are not the world's biggest exporters. These are just the countries for which plastic exports are very important. So we need to have mechanisms that will help them adjust to whether it's a market-led change or whether it's a regulatory-led change or whether it's the change that comes about because of the treaty. This is going to be something that will need to be, uh, to be addressed. So we will use market mechanisms to some impact, but then also let's look at what we have on the menu of non-market mechanisms. Can I have the next slide, please? So one of the most obvious levers is to turn off the taps that are already existing and which are encouraging production and consumption of plastic at levels which potentially would not be the case without these levers. So on figure number one, on the left-hand side, we are looking at financial flows going into fossil fuels. So this is current fossil fuel finance. These are figures that come from the IEA and from Ergvold, a NGO that focuses on fossil fuel finance. And what we see is that since the Paris Agreement, there's really been no abatement of the finance going into fossil fuels. Now, I can't show you finance into plastic because we don't have this data, but what we do know is that fossil fuels are strongly correlated with plastic and plastic is a derivative of fossil fuels. So you can see that at the moment, the taps of money are still strongly pushing into plastic. When we look at the figure on the right hand side, now we're looking at subsidies that are going into fossil fuels and implicitly lowering the cost of the inputs into plastic and potentially um, encouraging more consumption of it than we would have the case otherwise. So the explicit subsidies into fossil fuels is over a trillion dollars. So this is finance that if we could redirect this, this is finance already paid, it exists already. If it could be redirected and put into other uses, this would also help with the problem of plastic production, overproduction and waste. There are other ways of supporting low income households and low income consumers than, than this mechanism. Thinking about um, producer fossil fuel subsidies only, that's $51 billion a year. Okay, so we're not looking at consumer subsidies, just thinking about producer subsidies. That's already a very large amount of money. May I have the next slide? Diana, may I jump in? Because it's already seven minutes and we, okay. so we need to just swift through the other ones, give people the picture and we can also share with them the slides afterwards. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So in my next slide, so my next slide is looking at another lever, redirecting some finance. So this is a figure showing the finance that's going into petrochemicals, a large proportion of which goes into plastic, more than 90%. I want you to look particularly at the green flows in the bottom. These are flows that are coming from central banks and public development banks. So if we can redirect this, this will be a new source of finance that could be supportive for reducing plastic pollution, or we can try and regulate it in some way and ensure that it's used for purposes that are helping to reduce plastic pollution. Can I have the next slide, please? The next thing we talked about is uh, development funds and development banks. The problem here we're seeing is that finance into development banks, the figure on the right is the funds into the World Bank, this has fallen very dramatically over the last decades. And these are the funds that are going to be needed to help capitalize and harness the private sector that we've been talking about. So these funds and these banks are owned by governments. We need to increase their capitalization and also give them the scope to be able to increase their lending in different sorts of ways that will help to support enterprises and countries that are trying to deal with plastic pollution. With my next slide, please, let's think about the way that central banks can help plastic pollution. So there's actually a very long history of central banks targeting particular industries compared to other industries and guiding finance into uses where it would not otherwise go. 
So there's many countries, including Japan, Italy, Sweden, um, a very long list. We now also have a list of central banks that are guiding finance into uses where they are needed. Now, one of the easiest ways to do this is to insist on disclosure. And we heard Peggy and Gizem mention that earlier, that disclosure would be very helpful. This can be a requirement of central banks as the head of the finance institutions. May I have the next slide, please? So I want to just very quickly draw your attention to the fact that substitutes for plastic are already growing greatly. We're almost worth a third of plastic trade itself. And these are categories in which many developing countries do have a comparative advantage already. So once you start thinking about substitutes, we have to then think about industrial policy and how do we promote substitutes? Can I have the next slide, please? Oh, thank you, thank you. So um, what we need to do is to align all of these things, aligning industrial policy and macro and financial policies to try and um, get achieve the outcomes that are wanted from plastic pollution perspective and from a development perspective. And in all of these cat things, we follow the principles that we've, um, you know, a starting point for our principles is that we have special and differentiated treatment, yes. We have common differentiated responsibilities, yes. But we also have a lot of potential sources of revenue that can be harnessed and redirected to this important cause. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Diana. That's a, a, a really fast run through. I apologize for having to speed you up, but I think you did each of those slides in very swiftly and it was very, very clear. I would also, it was great to hear you end on sort of this uh, positive note too, that there, there is financing out there that if we use the right um, instruments and governments deploy the right policies, we have the capacity to shift it in the right, in the right direction. So, um, I've noted that it's three minutes to five and we're supposed to finish at five o'clock. So I apologize to all for having not enabled there to be time for enough Q&A. However, I hope that everyone who is here on the call and we have more than uh, 250 people who started, we still have 200 left, which means that um, you found it to be an enriching and worthwhile discussion to be in. So I wanna thank all of the speakers for having helped us paint a very holistic picture um, of all of the uh, aspects of financing that are relevant to generating this systems change um, required and just transitions required to end plastic pollution. And for also helping us to think hard about what this means in terms of the sorts of provisions and approaches we might need in the treaty itself. Um, when we close the session today, we will be putting together a compilation of all of the slides um, and with our colleagues from the Geneva Environment Network putting together a summary um, of the points today. So hopefully that will be helpful to all of those there. We've noted the questions um, and who they came from. So we'll try and endeavor that those of you who didn't have your question answered through the chat that we can get those responses to you. And then what that leaves it for me to do is firstly to thank all of our uh, panelists for really fantastic contributions for taking the time here. I really feel privileged to have been able to gather such a great uh, group of people and all of the expertise that we have here today. Hopefully you all learned a lot from each other also as speakers. Just before closing, I wanna turn over to my colleague Diana from the Geneva Environment Network to give a quick announcement of other uh, sessions that are coming up in the coming few weeks that will be of interest to those of you on this call. So over to Diana. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline, uh, also for uh, bringing all these experts uh, together and for the uh, enriching the discussion. So uh, we, as mentioned by Caroline, there was no time to really discuss the questions that were put in the chat, but you will find a lot of elements and links that have been shared uh, on the webpage of this event. So two uh, upcoming uh, sessions that for which we have dates is the launch of two reports that are important for the INC process. Uh, you can see them here on, on the screen. So two dates, 14th of March, 20th of March, two new reports. Um, the first one is the state on the science on plastic chemicals, identify and addressing chemicals and polymers of concern um, at 2 p.m. on the 14th of March. 
Uh, and another report coming up uh, also uh, soon uh, that is uh, has been prepared by uh, Guy Darendal is uh, climate impacts uh, of plastics, uh, global actions to stem uh, climate change and end plastic pollution. So um, not only will we launch these reports on this platform, but we also bring various stakeholders who have issued similar reports uh, to, to join the, and enrich the, the discussion on the findings of those two reports. And then um, a date that is not yet here because it hasn't yet been fixed, but as usual, we organize briefings ahead of each session of the INC. So we will also have uh, um, the general briefing with the chair, uh, the new chair of the INC process, uh, uh, briefing you on what to is expect, will expect you. And with also the secretariat of the INC process, what will, um, what will, what is planned uh, in Ottawa uh, uh, in April. So with that, I think we, we can close um, and, and, and we look forward to, to seeing you uh, uh, at, at the upcoming events, but also to have you back on the page where you will find the slides, uh, the links of what was presented today and more information on, on the next steps following on all the inputs that were put together on what Caroline and her team will be bringing to this uh, discussion on finance. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.